uh, so the top pod of the NPL, but these two players are currently seventh and eighth in that pod as we look at the opening hands. And there's that flourishing fox that you were talking about. Yeah, and you see Andrea's hand. He's kept a great one for what cycling is doing in the mid game. Uh, he has an Elspeth Nightmare, he has a Negate, but he doesn't have an answer to this fox right now. If Ray just goes fox double cycle on turn two, there's no way for Andrea to deal with this, and this is exactly the nightmare scenario where Andrea could just find himself losing the game. It, perhaps even the damage will be done by the time he gets that extinction event down. And you can see on our player cams there, Andrea, not happy to see that fox come down on turn number one. If you look at the hand here for Ray Sato, you know, a million cyclists and that key Iron Crag Pyromancer as well. Yeah, you, you see Ray glancing off to the side. This is just looking at what is Andrea's deck list, confirming is there any world in which I play a Drana Stinger on turn two? And and the answer is really no. With cards like Heartless Act and Elspeth Nightmare existing and Andrea not currently presenting a Heartless Act, Ray is going to make sure to put this fox in a position where he can't really get punished by uh some of the removal spells from Andrea and yeah, Fox is a three, three. This was, this was the win condition for Ray Sato. This was how he could really just steal this game and it snowball things out of control. Andrea has no answer until extinction event. By the time that comes down, he could have taken upwards of 10 damage from this Fox alone. So let's have a look at what Andrea is working with. There is that LCS Nightmare, which we talked about in the pre-game as an important card in this matchup, but not going to do a lot against the Flourishing Fox right now. There's also Extinction Event, as you say, ready to come off next turn, and a copy of Negate for uh, potentially some Zenith Flares later on. Yeah, the negate will be important once we get to the Zenith Flare state of the game. But right now for Andrea, the name of the game is Stabilization. He's going to try to just get the game to a state where it, he doesn't feel like he's just on the verge of death. And that's where we're currently at. Ray cycling preemptively, trying to find a third untapped land, which he currently doesn't have, in order to get another piece of cycling down. Uh, fortunately for Andrea, a bit of a reprieve. The man is not there and only taking eight damage from this one drop <laughs> before he's able to use his board wipe spell as a one for one against it. Yeah, I mean, you know, Extinction Event, it is going to do the job. It is going to get this fox off the board, but. It was one mana versus four mana, and you've already taken eight damage. Yorion, you know, two copies of Yorion in the hand. That might help Andrea a little bit later on, but otherwise, not a lot going on for Andrea Miguchi. Yeah, this is a bit of a heartbreaking draw for Andrea that Ray just got. Previously, Ray's best follow-up to what was happening on the board was just one of these creatures, Iron, either an Iron Crack Pyromancer or a Dranus Stinger, and Andrea had an Elspeth Nightmare ready. When Ray drew that Improbable Alliance, everything sort of shifted, and now Andrea's in a position where, yes, Elspeth Nightmare will remove this 1-1, one -one, but there's more one ones coming and Andrea is aware of that. So until we can find an answer to this improbable alliance, stabilizing the board may be out of the question. And that Elsa's nightmare coming down, taking out the one one means of course that it is no longer uh, available to potentially deal with both of these iron crack pyromancers that Ray has lined up. Although I guess Andrea does have two copies of Yorion, so maybe maybe his plan is just to keep this Elspeth nightmare around, uh, you know, forever. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting dance because right now Ray has the option of playing an Iron Crag Pyromancer and leaving up Disdainful Stroke. If he does so, he won't be getting the trigger on the Pyromancer or the Improbable Alliance. And Andrea will then take the Disdainful Stroke from the Elspeth Nightmare's second saga chapter of the saga and play Yorian and Blink it to deal with the Pyromancer. So instead, Ray may want to get the token here, leave up Disdainful Stroke while trying to keep cycling. And essentially put Andrea in the position where, okay, if you take my Disdainful Stroke, I'm going to have Zenith Flare and you're not going to have counter mana up. If you take my Zenith Flare, I've got some board pressure. So it, Ray is really just trying to dance around the possibility that this Elspeth's Nightmare may be here for a few turns, thanks to that Yorian that he knows is on a is in Andrea's hand. He doesn't know about the second copy, but at least the first copy is enough for Ray to be scared enough to leave up Disdainful Stroke. 
Right, I actually found a second copy of Improbable Alliance, and this is where things can start to get a little bit nutty, but Andrea's going to actually just blow that negate immediately on it. Yeah, I, I, Andrea knows that he can't allow those disdainful strokes. He can't allow those improbable alliances to start getting out of hand. He doesn't have an answer to them right now. No binding the old gods, which would be ideal with two copies of Yorian in hand to start dealing with those. But at least now, getting rid of the disdainful stroke, he can blink the nightmare, get rid of this fairy, and force Ray to use the Zenith Flare for six, which isn't quite enough to close out this game at the moment. Uh, if you're Ray, are you actually pointing this at the Yorion or at Face? It, it's really going to be hard because it, typically you do want to point it at Face and hope that you can draw another or close out the game with those Iron Master. <laughs> Iron Crag Pyromancers, which you still have, but you do also know that with that Elspeth's Nightmare exiling your graveyard on the third Saga chapter, uh, you're not going to have another Zenith Flare as a potential out, but I think with two Pyromancers, Ray just has to point at face and hope that he's able to close out the game at instant speed before Andre is able to kind of present that sort of uh, stabilization. Just as you said, face is the place. Zenith Flare is going to take a big chunk out of Andrea Mangucci's life total, goes all the way down to six. Find an extinction event, which uh, is given that Andrea knows about the double Iron Crank Pyromancer in hand for Ray Sato, it could lead to some big blowout um, sweeper turns later on. It, it, it's possible for Ray to end the game in this turn cycle. Play a Pyromancer, cycle the Fox, deal three damage. If you find another one mana cycler and pass the turn, on Andrea's turn, if he goes one mana cycle into one mana cycle, that would deal the damage Ray needs to close out the game. The disaster scenario for Ray here, which I do not believe there's a world in which we see it, is just playing double Iron Crank Fire Master, <laughs> passing, try to close out the game the next turn. For Ray, he knows that he only needs to deal three damage twice. So play these one at a time, use the cycle. Maybe you close it out in this turn cycle, maybe you don't. You're not dying at 22. Is there a temptation to just wait? Like, maybe if you draw an untapped land next turn, you can just do it all? I don't think so. I don't think you want to give Andrea any opportunity to find some way to deal with these. Uh, if you play one and then play the other, you're giving your opponent priority. They could have a Heartless Act. They could have an Eliminate. You just don't want to walk into it. And that's another one mana cycler. So. Oh, here we go. Here we go. The, the dream is alive for Ray. I, I don't know if we'll see something like an upkeep stop upkeep, set. Yeah. Uh, he may obviously want to wait until this Elspeth's Nightmare chapter goes off, even though that allows Andrea to have another look at a card draw in terms of finding a removal spell, but it, it at least sets you up better for the late game here. All right. So it's not going to happen in the upkeep, but Ray Sato does have the starting development. That is one mana cycle number one. Is it a disaster if you just go for it in the end step or something and, you know, you don't find it? Uh, no, because you do have that improbable alliance in play. Uh, the biggest disaster would be if Andrea had a removal spell, but even then you do have the Iron Crack Pyromancer. It's just you no longer have the guarantee. So I think given that, there's no real reason for Ray to risk it here. If Andrea passes and Ray gets to untap, the game is over. Uh, he has that startling development. So it, it's just a matter of... It, Playing it safe here, I think, is the name of the game for Ray. No reason to be ambitious and go for it. So, Mangucci, Yorion on the battlefield. It's going to cycle away a Zagoth Triome. Has only two mana up now. Oh, and just finds another Zagoth Triome. So, that is going to do it. Mangucci, knowing about the Iron Crag Pyromancer in hand is just going to scoop it up and we are going to see a game number two. And uh, Marnie, the reputations of the commentary team are on the line here. Yeah, I think the reputation is really just it, proving true that we are much more powerful than we think we are with our caster curses. As, uh, we really just wish the worst case scenario put on Andre in that first game. <laughs> All right, well, any um, any big changes here for either player between games one and two? Andrea gets access to two copies of Cling to Dust. That's massive for the matchup, as well as another Archon of Sun's Grace. Cling to Dust, not only able to selectively remove cards from your opponent's graveyard to keep it 
down a bit, but also able to give you some amount of life gain, which is always helpful. What we saw happen in that game was the Iron Crag Power Masters closed it out, uh, and if Andrea had a bit of life gain, he may have been able to sp stabilize it, as we see. Mm -hmm. uh, the sideboarding is a bit reverse, but for Andrea, not a actually bringing in cling to dust, not deeming wow. it necessary for the matchup. Instead, just going for more removal spells, eliminate another copy, just trying to make sure he doesn't die to that fox. As he's taking out some copies of Heartless Act, just really emphasizing how important that flourishing fox is for the matchup. Shadow's Bird is actually a nice one as well. Not only does it get rid of any pesky foxes on the battlefield, it can also take out a lot of these cycling cards from the graveyard if they're creatures. So uh, a nice sideboard in there for Andrea Mangucci. As we say, as you say, Marnie, they are a little bit uh, topsy-turvy here, but we are going to go down into the action in game number two. And it looks like Andrea's keeping this hand of Omen of the Sun, Doom for Todd and the Gate, and Elspeth's Nightmare. That's a nice curve out for him. As for Ray, this is a lot of cyclers. This is a lot of cyclers, but fortunately for Andrea, at least, there's no turn one startling fox, there's the flourishing fox, there's no creature of any kind here in Ray's hand. So it, the early developmental turns being spent on cycling rather than pressuring is something that will play exactly into Andrea's game plan because Andrea is happy to play an Elsa's Nightmare without anything on the board in terms of a target for removal if it means that he'll be able to attack this hand from Ray, get rid of maybe a Zenith Flare or a Counterspell, and then just exile whatever cycling cards have already been used in the graveyard and essentially reset Ray to redevelop. Oh, well. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before Ray can redevelop, he has to actually develop first. <laughs> <laughs> um, mystical dispute, disdainful strike. So a little bit of a reaction, reactive counter magic for Ray Sato, but otherwise just going to rely on uh, getting these cyclers down. And this is kind of it reminds me a little bit all of the older cycling decks. You know, before Improbable Lines, before Iron Crag Pyromancer became big. A lot of their starts look like this. It was just cycling, 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 Zenith Flare. Yeah, this has always been one of the quote unquote weaknesses of the cycling deck. Your best starts are incredible. When you have a turn one flourishing fox, it looks so good. When you don't, everything is a little bit harder. You have to work more for those wins. Things don't snowball as quickly. It's part of the reason why we've seen perhaps a new surge in popularity for Boro Cycling and Historic is because thanks to Historic Anthology 4, they got access to that Flame Blade Adept. So now they have not four one drops but it said they have access to up to eight one drops that can kind of snowball the game and, and that's exactly what they're looking for just more consistency being able to have their good draws more often so we're in at race starters end step Mangucci's putting omen of the sea on the stack and ray's actually thinking about countering it yeah, I think Ray is hoping to maybe make things a bit more awkward for Andrea. Just hope that he's catching him in a not great position because Ray's hand just isn't that great. And he needs Andrea to have a bad draw. So hoping maybe Andrea misses some land drops. Maybe he just doesn't have the tools he needs. Unfortunately for Ray, Andrea's hand is incredible. <laughs> Very nice indeed. Double Omen of the Sun that's going to be able to hold down the ground, you know, pretty well for Andrea Mangucci. Buff up the life total a little bit. Doom foretold, of course, you know, the key keystone of this deck, as it were. And Elspeth's Nightmare, we've already talked about that card a lot, and we're going to see a lot more of it, I, I assume, over this weekend. Uh, and uh, Marnie, is there a reason for Ray not to have um, developed out that Improbable Alliance last turn? Uh, perhaps just try to not make it vulnerable to a counterspell. Uh, he did have the Mystical Dispute available to him, but maybe just wanting to not play it and then walk into it binding the old gods. Now, if he plays it this turn, he'll have to staple stroke up as last turn. Just leaving up Mystical Dispute would not have been an answer to binding. And it, we've emphasized the importance of that card in the matchup just because it does come down and more or less deal with anything uh being presented by ray in terms of permanence all right so andre Mangucci not going to let that improbable alliance even hit the battlefield this time and as we go back over he actually maybe looking for a little bit of a uh, mana here 
not finding its fifth land drop just yet. Yeah, you just see the main phase, Omen of the Sea. Uh, I'll land, an untapped land would be great. I, I think we're starting to approach the point of the game where Andrea, with no counter spells left, will want to play an Elspeth's Nightmare on an empty board, just prioritizing the duress effect of the second chapter, as well as the uh, Graveyard Exile. There's already four cycling cards in the Graveyard, so it would serve as a nice reset. Uh, does still have the option of uh, keeping up Omen of the Sun, rather than uh, just play the Elspeth's Nightmare. But it, it's one of those things where, it, it, with no counter spells, you may get your, you may see yourself punished with a line from Ray where he goes, cycle, cycle, draws another one mana cycler in the land, and suddenly these Zen Zenith Flares are coming across for seven before Andrea has a chance to interact with them. Well, just as you say, Marnie, double Zenith there in hand. The count is six, thanks to that. Very convenient little ticker on the card itself. And uh, here comes that first copy of Omen of the Sun. And it's just interesting how the maths, you know, shifts with these tiny increments in, you know, a card in the graveyard here, a couple of life points there. Yeah, it's the two incidental life gain that's just more or less tacked on to Omen of the Sun. It, it, you know, there are matchups like Solta Ultimatum where that number just does not matter at all. And then there's matchups like Cycling, like Monored Agro, where two life can be the entire difference maker. We've seen so many games over the past year of Standard uh, end with a stomp to the face. But two more life, and it, that's another turn where that stomp is not killing you. So here comes that naked Elspeth's Nightmare. Um, yeah, Andrea now has the Mystical Dispute as backup as well, in case Ray tries to pick a fight over this. Uh, I think it is in Ray's best interest to pick a fight over this, as it, his hand will more or less feel fur forced uh, if he does it. But I think with Andrea not being able to counter a Zenith Flare, you have to use the Mystical Dispute here. You can't afford to keep it up. There's not that many blue cards that you're fighting over in this matchup. Uh, the Cycling deck really is more or less a Boros deck with counter spells, so... Mm -hmm. it, if the counter spells aren't the cards you're interested in fighting over with Mystical Dispute, what is it you're fighting over? And uh, you see Andre using the Mystical Dispute exactly for that reason. So, a little bit of a battle on the stack here between the two players. Drannis thing gets cycled away, does not find any more Mystical Disputes, so Elsa's Nightmare is going to resolve. And Ray Sato has just one turn to cast one of these Zenith Lairs before that duress effect comes down. Yeah, Ray, Ray knows that he's going to lose the Zenith Flare to uh, Elspeth's Nightmare uh, if he doesn't cast it um, before it... If he doesn't find a way to cast both, which he can't do. But given mm -hmm. that, there's no reason for him to operate a sorcery speed here uh, other than hope maybe playing around another counter spell. So it, you see Ray just kind of thinking about the possibilities. Do I leave up to Staple Stroke? Does that help me in any way? Uh, do I cycle, try to find something? And actually, uh, going for Valiant Rescuer, I think this is a really cool nod from Ray that I'm going to have the Zenith Flare on my next turn anyways, so mm -hmm. I may as well just try to develop here uh, past the turn, and if I'm only going to cast one Zenith Flare this game, it's going to be for more than seven. Right. So, we assume this duress is going to take away one of the Zenith Flares. Uh, we do know that Mangucci has actually found a second copy of Elsa's Nightmare. Wow! He actually goes for the Disdainful Stroke. Right, so what I was going to say was, now that Ray opted not to cast the Zenith Flare, what happens is Andrea knows on Ray's next turn, he can cast one Zenith Flare. After that, Andrea will get another turn back, and Ray's graveyard will be gone. Z the second Zenith Flare will be reset to zero. So Andrea doesn't have to get rid of the second one here. He can just afford to get rid of that Disdainful Stroke, and that means that his uh, Doom Foretold is good to resolve here. Deal with the Valiant Rescuer, and it, he's now really set up a position where, yes, Ray can cast the Zenith Flare, but Andrea's at 22. He's not worried about his life total going down to zero anytime soon. And <laughs> just, just as you were telling us about how Elsa's Nightmare Chapter 3 was going to invalidate the second Zenith Flare, the third one comes to join the party. So uh, much like the buses in my hometown, all three yeah. are coming at once. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
<laughs> Just when you don't want them to. Yeah, Ray really wasn't hoping for the third Zenith Flare here, as it is not trivial for Cycling to rebuild a graveyard. Yes, you're going to deal 11 here, potentially have Andrea's life total, and have access to more options, but once you're reset, you really need to build that up slowly again, and that's going to be a big ask. Well, you know, one of these Zenith Flares is going to take out half of Andrea Mangucci's life total, and that's really the usually game-ending burst of damage that we see out of these cycling decks, but Elspeth's Nightmare, this nice three-mana uncommon saga from Theros Beyond Death, just doing so much work in these Doom Foretold decks. Yeah, this Elspeth's Nightmare just has, has been such an important card. We've seen it in tons of different matchups uh, throughout the time that has been legal since Theros Beyond Death came out, and it, it's really a matter of the Graveyard Exile can be so relevant. The Duress effect can be so relevant, and having all of it available on a saga that you can blink with Yorian is just so massively relevant to just early removal, it, really setting yourself up for success as it, now you see actually <laughs> discarding a Zenith player. You see that ticker number that was so helpful before showing us the 10, the 11, now the very sad zero on that Zenith player. Well, you know, at least it gives you it means that you don't have to discard a real card to, to Doom Foretold. But <laughs> Andrea Mangucci in a dominant position now as we Swing in with that 2 2 Knight with Vigilance. Oodles of removal in hand. Elspeth's Nightmare Eliminate and Heartless Axe as well. Yorion Sky Nomad. That one can come down. You know, not gonna, it's not going to be this turn, but potentially, you know, going to be blinking a couple of omens. And uh, now we see the Esperoni deck you know, in its stride. Yeah, you see Andrea really feeling himself in, in the camera, <laughs> just bopping along to the music. Uh, but realistically he knows that he's not out of the woods yet uh he understands that even if he wins this game he's going to a third game against the cycling deck that will be on the play and that's when it's at a scariest that's when the turn one flourishing foss can come out and you may not have an answer to it so it, andreas still has a lot of work ahead of him but at least here in game two, uh he's found a way to stabilize the board and really put himself in the best position to take this game well, Ray did find an improbable alliance and, you know, does not have a cycler to pair with it, but does have a negate and a zenith flare. And improbable alliance does have that activated ability for six, which, you know, you do not see happen in standard very often at all. But maybe desperate times. <laughs> desperate times is exactly why improbable alliance can it, it kind of take over games sometimes from the cycling deck because it does give you those opportunities where it can just suddenly end the game and I think it's time for another uh, empty board Elspeth's nightmare as these are the types of play that's, that Andrea recognizes will win him the game and Ray Sato snaps off the negate excellent choice of negate art by the Ooh. way that is Ooh. beautiful oh boon of the wish giver are we, are we gonna see Ray Sato just Hard cast it to draw for. Opportunity has never looked so good. I mean, Andrea, you know, has a favorite passage, does have the potential for a counter spell in hand if you're looking at it from Ray Sata's perspective, but you've got to go for it. Here we go. Boon of the Wish Giver, draw four cards. <laughs> <laughs> Make a 1-1. One, one. Yeah. And the cards are nice as well. Second Improbable Alliance, startling development, another boon. It's a start. It, it, it is absolutely a start. Part of the problem for Ray is that is the third Zenith Flare that we see in his hand. Uh, so only one more left in the deck after that. And for Andrea, the shields are down. So he now knows that if he wants to play Yorian, blink two Omen of the Suns, get a bunch more tokens, as well as another card off this Golden Egg, and continue putting on pressure, uh, the coast is free to do so. Well, Andre even feels so comfortable that he's going to use the Heartless Act on this 1-1 one, one fairy token. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, for him, with that second Elspeth's Nightmare being countered, Andrea knows that he doesn't have inevitability in terms of making sure that Ray's graveyard count is down long enough for uh, 
two more or one more Zenith Flare to knock him out. So he does want to put on pressure. He does want to start uh, breaking through as much as possible. As, uh, after draw four, it's not unreasonable to expect Ray to have another improbable alliance. However improbable it may or may not be. Uh, so it, it's really a matter of before the board gets clogged up, before his creatures start trading off with replaceable tokens, he, he wants to get that damage in. Improbable though it may be, Andrea is actually the one with the alliance of creatures on his side of the battlefield. So we see Ray Sato find a flourishing fox, which is at this point in the game another uh, another one mana cycle. We don't really see these foxes coming down at this late stage. Yeah, and Ray is now at the point where because he has access to so much mana, uh, he's able to set up turns where he draws a second card on his turn and draws potentially two cards on Andrea's turn, making two more tokens with that improbable alliance. So uh, we may start seeing Ray really trying to prioritize maximum token creation uh, over the course of the next few turns. We expect to see these fairy tokens start to try and, you know, Make a dent in the, the army that Andrea Mangucci has managed to put together. Shadow's verdict for Andrea. Shadow's verdict will do a nice job of cleaning up some of the cycling creatures that are in the graveyard. I think Ray will cycle, happily cycle another fox rather than uh, give up the boon of the wish giver. Uh, we saw the draw four from Boon last turn, just uh, or two turns ago now, be so important for Ray and. It, if he's going to win this game, however unlikely as it looked a few turns ago, it, it all starts with those copies of draw four cards available in his deck. So lining up the blocks now, looks like he's going to be taking five from those one ones, making a trade, getting that knight off the board and potentially chumping the Yorion. Five isn't that much. However, uh, he decides to take five here. It, it's really not that much. I like the change in blocks. Ray was initially considering a double block to get rid of the 2-2, but Andrea may be stranded with removal spells in hand. This is something that Ray has to be aware of. And by double blocking, you're essentially giving him a better use of those removal spells, keeping his creature alive and getting rid of both of those tokens in the process. So I like just trying to keep Andrea's board in check. Unlike for Ray, the tokens on Andrea's side are, are not never ending you can clear them out slowly. And once Ray clears out the tokens, he can just chomp Yorian. As long as he has that Zenith Flare, uh, the tokens <laughs> will just keep on coming and he will buy time. It's not like he's just treading water. Okay. These boons of the wish giver, Marnie, I'm in love. If they're doing, you know, usually you're used to seeing a deck like Demir Rogues throw out these draw fours, but... We're so used to seeing that card just being cycled away for one. Yeah, I remember there was a tread a while ago on Twitter about cycling players. I, of the non-creature cycling cards, w rank them. And I, okay. I was baffled <laughs> to see many players not put Boon of the Wish Giver as the number one among your cards that you're primarily playing for just single mana cycling but have other uses. Is Drawing four cards in a game where you're otherwise losing can completely turn things around, as we're seeing here for Race Auto. And that Zenith Flare, the number is going back up, Marnie. The ticker is back up at seven. There's two more copies of Boon in hand, so that's potentially nine. Zenith Flare for nine. And, you know, and Manguchi trying to put pressure on Ray Sata's life total. Let's not forget that Zenith Flare actually gains life for Ray as well. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is starting to look almost bad for Andrea. He still has a board position, but Ray isn't really running out of gas anymore. He he may choose to cycle a Boon of the Wish Giver here and try to get two more tokens, but, it, you know, if you don't find another cycling card with this, you have to make the choice of cycling the last boon you have in your hand. And I think Ray is in a position now where he may want to actually cast another boon for four more cards. So it, perhaps not wanting to uh, risk the cycle here, not wanting to actually give up one boon to accomplish nothing, and instead just maybe making some blocks with the tokens he has available to him. You know that meme where it's like they're, they're playing Uno and they're like, you know, you can either win the game or draw 25. 
That's kind of what I'm imagining right now. I would rather lose a game and not draw, than not draw four. But here we go. Ray Sato is going to cycle away that first boon. And just as we were talking about Manny, it put in the position where he has cycle away the second copy as well. Although finding a third improbable alliance isn't that shabby either. Not that shabby for sure, considering just how much work they're doing here. Andrea has not found the all-important binding of the old gods to deal with the enchantments. And it, you actually see Ray acknowledge and cycle his uh, clock there. Ray, one of the most deliberate players in the MPL, always takes his time in matches. But part of the result is that he needs to be aware of his clock when you're in game two, up a game. But if you lose this game and you go into the third with maybe eight minutes on your clock and you don't have that flourishing Fox draw to close out the game quickly, you get into another grindy game like this. That clock is a real concern. Archon of Sun's Grace, now the consideration for Andrea Mancucci. Ray Sato has the disdainful stroke in hand, ready and waiting. Yeah, I, I, I think at this point, Ray is just kind of wondering, does this Archon do enough? Uh, the life gain, really just the most important thing, and I think the ultimate decider. If it was just another flyer, uh, you could chop that forever with Improbable Alliance tokens, but if that starts gaining life, it completely throws off your Zenith Flare math, and considering Ray only has access to one more Zenith Flare after one, the one it currently sitting in his hand, uh, you need every point of damage to matter. Now with three Improbable Alliances, we're going to see that six mana activation here, and three tokens, get rid of one of these pathways, hopefully try to find some more mm -hmm. cycling cards to start the cycle anew, as it were. How many Improbable Alliances do you need on the battlefield before it becomes probable? I mean, I if one could say the idea of having three improbable alliances on the battlefield at the same time in and of itself is still pretty improbable, even though we're seeing it. Well, right, but now that it's crystallized, I mean, it's like Schrodinger's alliance at this point for me. <laughs> <laughs> Until you see it doesn't exist. <laughs> now it's down. I feel like it it was inevitable. All right, <laughs> let's ditch the philosophical musings. Back to the action. Yuri on Sky Nomad. A fairy rogue token is jumping in front of that one. Ray Sato goes down to eight from the night. Oh, that's a one mana cycler. There's a one mana cycler. Doesn't have to use this triumph quite yet. And Ray is approaching the point where, with these tokens, he will not have to use the Zenith Flare to stabilize his life total. He now has. Enough chumpers for the Yorian uh, will be able to quadruple block if he wanted, or just double block here on the night, start chumping it, and now is when you see the tide of the game shift as Ray feels comfortable attacking. And if you're an Andreas C, you're not holding a counter spell for a Zenith player, you hate to see that attack. Mm. Oh, Pelucranus Unchained. That one is something you would want against something like Demir Rogues. I wonder if it does anything against an army of chump blockers, Marnie. Uh, it does something, for sure. If Andrea is able to get the board somewhat smaller, the Pelucranos, with the amount of mana that he has available to him, may be able to clear off all the blockers. Unfortunately for Andrea, uh, he does need three green mana to really get the maximum number of fights that he needs uh, from the from Pelucranos, he only has access to two right mm. now uh, on the side of the battlefield. There is a golden egg to give him a third green uh, in a pinch if he needs it, but it, it's also the situation where it, you'd rather potentially use that golden egg for life. Um, here we find we see Ray Sato finding a card that came in from the sideboard for game number two, Riel the Everwise. Um, this card can be very powerful when it gets going. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of an engine in and of itself. It's a large creature here, uh, which is quite powerful, but it does also essentially give you more cards as you start cycling. Uh, for Andrea, Riel is <laughs> essentially just jackpot, as it's finally a target for that Eliminate that he's been holding <laughs> for, a, I think, the entire game at this point. All right, so Riel the Everwise... Just an O3 on its face, but it does get plus one plus one for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. And at this point, we have to imagine Ray Sato has plenty of those. 
And of course, that second ability as well, whenever you discard a card for the first time, you actually draw two cards. So uh, you actually draw an extra card as on top of your cycle if you're cycling. So yeah. Riel, a nice one here for Ray Sato. And Andrea, hmm, he's... I mean, just watching Andrea's play, I'm okay, really feeling his oats here. He's going to fire off this Eliminate before that ability can trigger. Yeah, really unfortunate for Ray, as with cycling, discarding the card is part of the cost. So you would put a real trigger on the stack immediately, regardless of whether your opponent has a removal spell. In Probable Alliance, there's no cost to discard there. So this is the one sort of uh, <laughs> looting or draw discard effect that Ray has in his deck that would allow Andrea to eliminate this real if he wanted to. It, you see Andrea pause just because... It, <laughs> Not really sure if this is the difference maker here and perhaps wanted to be save his eliminate and use Shadow's Verdict next turn anyways, realizing one mm. more card isn't going to be uh, making it or breaking it here against Ray's current state. What if that one more card is actually four more cards in a trench coat? <laughs> uh this is scary. Andrea needs to gain life here. That Zenith player is not that far from killing him. It's not and far! <laughs> Andrea only has four here. Four is not six. Ray is still going to be a two after the Shadows Verdict. That Night Token is going away, and it, uh, this okay. is possible. Uh, maybe. Okay, so Shadows Verdict. Yorion comes across. Ray is at two. Andrea does not have counter spell backup. Ray does have counter spell backup. And Zenith Fair currently at seven after that Shadow's Verdict, you know, it took out so many of those creatures from the graveyard as well. Yeah, let's draw four. four. Of the cards for Ray were creatures in the graveyard. So Shadow's Verdict, buying Andrea some more time now. That that was a good reset. And something Ray has to be aware of, there's 10 cards left in his library. One of those cards is Zenith Flare. Uh, how many of those cards are actually cycling cards remaining here? And that's kind of the danger, right, Marnie, when you start sideboarding cards like Real or extra counter spells into the cycling deck. You do sometimes thin out, you know, your actual cycles. Yeah, so this is Ray's clock ticking down, Ray looking at his deck, really just trying to make note of what do I have left, what am I drawing to. He knows there's a Zenith Flare left, that, that's the big one. Uh, it, it's it's Pelucranos time, of course, for Ray, just really get the 12-12 uh, out of the graveyard now and hope that will do some work in uh, closing out this game, but uh, Andrea isn't able to attack anymore with Yori, and every time he attacks, he's going to be trading one block for taking more damage on the returning end for Ray. Now, let's see if Andrea can take out... No, as you said before, Marnie, there's only still only two green mana available to Andrea, so he does have one fight available, but won't be able to clear out these blockers. The mm -hmm. hardest thing for Andrea, actually, is not only two green mana, but it, it, his third black source is that Indelva oh. Triome that is also a green source. What about Shredded Sails off the top <laughs> while Yorion had four damage on it? Ray Sato didn't even consider it. I got so excited, Money. I was like, wow, look at this. Shredded Sails going to be able to take down Yorion, but nope. Ray's got his eyes <laughs> on the keep fight. going. Yeah, keep, keep going. He then has said, five creatures here. Ticker goes up to nine, and there's still, Cycle. we think, one, one Zenith Flare in the deck. Yeah, still one Zenith Flare remaining. Cycle here, that, that Zenith Flare up to 10. Uh, that Zenith Flare oh. up to 11. Uh, Andrea is able to remove one of these tokens. So if Ray finds another Cycler here off the Shredded Sails, I believe that would be lethal on this turn cycle. Okay, so Andrea, first of all, has to eliminate one of these tokens, or fight one of these tokens. And he can only do one or the other. He doesn't have oh my the goodness. black mana. He does not he have double to black. Green and black to cast Belucranos. It's not even an auto-tapper issue. He just didn't have the mana to do both. Goodness me. There's a fabled passage. And Ray starts actually not going for that line you were talking about, not trying to find the last couple of cyclers. This is okay. really interesting. This is so tense. <laughs> okay, Andrea, I believe, has lost. He does have access to fight, 
fight, eliminate, uh, to clear the three blockers that Ray has access to. However, mm. Ray has a Zenith Flare for 11. It would put Andrea at one. It would put him up to 13. Uh, Andrea has 13. Wait, I, Andrea may have yeah. not lost. No, it doesn't Andrea, because the Pelucronos would, le- would lose two counters. So that's exactly. 13? There's no hope, though, because Ray just won't take the risky line. He'll just cycle the Shredded Sails, activate Improbable Alliance, make three more tokens, make sure that he's able to block. So there's no line for Andrea to get rid of all these blockers. It's over. (laughs) It's over. We got very Uh, excited for a millisecond here. We were like, does he have it? But it looks like he does not have it. It looks like Andrea knows this as well. Here we I mean, go. It's going to be an activation of Improbable Alliance in the end step for Ray Sato. Discard a land, cycle away this Shredded Sails. That's going to be the second card draw for turn, triggering the three Improbable Alliances. This is... <laughs> Ray has just <laughs> grinded this game out for so many turns, and <laughs> now the end is in sight. He has a negate backup. It, those two cards in Andrea's hand needs to be exactly double counterspell here for the Zenith Flare for Andrea to just survive, and even that, he still wouldn't be winning the game. So just... <sighs> oh, this is so, Aww. so darn tight here, and I don't think Andrea has it. <laughs> Right, and it, you know, at this point, it looks like Ray Sato was so ahead, and all these eight tokens, a million cards in hand, but it was very tight. Andrea could really have, you know, if there was a little bit, you know, maybe if the mana was different, a few more black sources, a few more green sources could have taken out these blockers in the previous turn. But as things stand, it's going to be six fairies coming across in the air. Two Ray, damage. That's thinking. all Andrea needed. Yeah, just double checking everything before hitting send. And Andrea never found a binding the old gods that game, and mm. the one card that could take over this sort of dominant game from Andrea was Improbable Alliance. Just turn after turn, giving Ray more more value for what he was already doing, which was just drawing cards. And really quite a nice treat as well. Wow, Ray actually playing around that double counter spell that you're talking about so heavily. And that's really one of the hallmarks of players at this skill level is that they really think about how could I possibly lose from this position as much as how do I win? Yeah, this is just Ray really making sure when every match matters, when every game matters in this league weekend, he's going to dot every I, cross every T, and just make sure that he doesn't walk into any potential lethal or any potential out from Andrea. So Ray passing the turn, but puts a stop in his own end step going to let Andrea use up some of this mana and wow, passing priority yet again, Andrea takes the bait, says okay I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some fighting here and we're going to see it now the finishing blow, Zenith Flare for Ray Sato ticker is at more than seven no <laughs> he's not about it <laughs> Okay, well, let me, let's go for round three. Now. 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 Now There's one card left. left. There's four mana available. Has the negate back up. Now we're going to see the finishing blow. Zenith Blair at the face. And Draymond Gucci can only nod in acknowledgement. Ray Sato takes down our round number one of Strixhaven the weekend. With wow. cycling, oh. <laughs> wow, oh. finishing things off against four color, I'll, I'm doing foretold, two games to zero. Yeah, just those improbable alliances look so incredible for Ray. I, I think it's no surprise that we've seen what used to be Boro cycling really prioritize being Jeskai cycling now as being able to consistently cast that enchantment to just get token after token each turn is just game changing. All right, well, we are going to uh, give you a little preview of what is coming up um, after the break. Uh, We are going to have some more magic from round number one, and we're actually going to go down to pod B from the MPL, the 
upper half of Pod B when we have superstar Seth Manfield up against former world champion Javier Dominguez. Demir Road against Gamer Adventures. Former world champions in both uh, both t- sides, and uh, those deck colors are a bit off. Demir Rogues is just Demir. White is only for Luris. Teamer Adventures is just Teamer. Black is only for Obaj. But it, we've seen this matchup before. We saw Javier fall to Arna Hushabeth uh, playing this Demir Rose deck in the uh, in the Caltime Championship. So a bit of a grudge match for him against the archetype. <laughs> All right, well, we are going to go away for a few short messages, but stay tuned when we see the clash of these two titans in a few minutes. Welcome back to coverage of the April Strixhaven League Weekend. My name is Hai and I'm here with my good friend Mani. We are about to bring you the second feature match of our round number one. And this is going to be coming from pod B of the MPL. But Mani, this is, it's actually quite interesting because Seth Manfield and um, Javier Dominguez, who we're about to see, both of them are at 27 points currently. And the match we just saw between Andrea Mangucci and Ray Sato, they were actually both at 27 points as well, even though they were in pod A. So there's actually quite a lot at stake here. And this is a nice time to really talk about the dynamic nature of the pod system we have going on this weekend, because the winner of this match is going to go up to 28 points, putting them level with Ray Sato, who just went up to 28. And the loser is actually going to um, 
you know, stay on 27, but the winner is going to leapfrog Andrea Mangucci, who, even though he's in a pod above, is going to have less points. Yeah, these are some of the shifts we're going to see throughout the weekend. Like we mentioned at the start of the day, we're repotting after every three rounds based on how the standings shift. So for Seth and Javier, yes, they have the same number of points as Andrea and Ray, but they started in a different pod. They're going to play in this pod for three rounds. And if one of them gets a 3-0 here in this pod B, they're going to leapfrog a few players and really give themselves a shot to be in pod A for the second uh pod of the day and that's going to be big that's the first step to trying to leapfrog some of the players at the top because when you're playing within your pod that means you're taking away points essentially from the players you're playing against that's the road for one of these players to get over past somebody like Gavin if like pvddr if they're trying to get that first place spot over the course of this weekend quite right money just to remind our viewers paulo Vito Damondo Rosa sitting at the top of the MPL with 33 points. There are 12 matches happening this weekend. Each match is worth one point. That's just how close it is, you know, even at the top. Even for someone like uh, Seth Manfield or Javier in the at the 27 point slot, it's not a long, a big gap. You know, that gap is not insurmountable. It's manageable. It's all manageable. So exciting stuff to come. Uh, let's see if we can pull up the players' deck list here for our second feature match of round number one. We have Seth Manfield on Demir Rogues, one of the most popular choices this weekend. Yeah, it, it is it, the most popular or at least tied for the most popular deck in the MPL, second most popular in the Rivals League for good reason. We just saw this deck prove once again why it's such a standard powerhouse and take down the Caltime Championship in the hands of Arna Hushambeth. Uh, this list pretty standard. We see all the things that we're used to seeing. Two copies of Lull Mage's Domination mm. in the main deck. Not something we always see. It, it cycles in and out a nod to lovestruck beast deck specifically perhaps expecting a bit of an over adjustment for the success of rogues uh if people try to bring aggressive decks to target rogues you bring lovestruck beast decks to target the aggressive decks and Rogues need some answers to those. Uh, something interesting in this build, four main deck copies of, of One Mind. So really trying to get an edge in some of the blue matchups, specifically the Rogues Mirror, for example, or the Sultai Ultimatum matchup, even though Rogues doesn't really need that much of an edge in that matchup yeah. anyways. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, there's a bit of a teched out list here from Seth. Uh, a bit light on removal, still three copies of Heartless Act and four Adrenaline Lock, but a lot more card advantage. All right, let's have a look over at what Javier brought to the table. Tima Adventures. And the first thing that stands out to me, Marnie, in this <laughs> list, I mean, there's a lot of things, but the first thing, one copy of Perforos's Intervention in the main deck. Yeah, one copy of Perforos's in Intervention. Just something to do with all of that mana that this deck has <laughs> access to in terms of another way to close out the game with haste. You already have Goldspan Dragons to do that, but this is another tool that gives you uh, an option, as well as just being a bit of a flexible removal spell as you need it. Something that I find interesting here is... Javier's recognition and understanding of the metagame uh, for the Caltime Championship. I believe Javier was the player that brought Teamer Adventures with no Alvarez Epiphany, opting mm -hmm. not to want them in that metagame. Here, he's brought two. So either even with his top eight performance, he wasn't happy with the lack of Alvarez <laughs> Epiphanies, or in his opinion, something changed in the metagame between two weekends ago and now that makes it correct to include the card here when he didn't previously. Well, I mean, nobody's going to be complaining in terms of, you know, in the viewership. I think everybody loves to see an hour and Epiphany go off. Magic players only want one thing, and it is Time Walk Effects. So we will see how Javier Dominguez fares with this deck list as we go down to have a look at the opening hands here. And a quick little sneak peek at the sideboards for both players as well. Players looking sharp and ready to go see that see them in their little decked out in their team jerseys yeah javier starting out the play with what looks to be an incredible hand from him oh double edge will innkeeper bone crusher giant and kazandu mammoth 
having a look at what Seth's working with, there is that ruined crab, uh, along with Of One Mind, Into the Story, and Agadim's Awakening. So Seth really riding on the back of this crustacean here, whereas Javier has the double Edwell Innkeeper start. Oh, and I, I love this decision making already from Javier. Recognizing he only has one green mana in his hand, if he doesn't play that Kazandu Mammoth as a land, means that he doesn't have Kazandu Mammoth on turn three anyways. Plays it as a tapped green source, which gives him the option of going double edge wall innkeeper on two, and set up to just cast Bone Crusher Giant immediately on turn three, cashing mm -hmm. it in for two cards. In order for Seth to stop that, he needs to have one of those copies of Heartless Act we talked about. Drown and Loch not going to be live to remove an edge wall innkeeper on turn <gasps> two, because Javier doesn't have have any mill effects available that he can cast here so no cards in the, or seth at least no cards in the graveyard means that seth has no answer to these innkeepers they're going to remain on the board for that bone crusher giant next turn and seth actually led off on the zagos triumph on the tap land so ruin crab is coming down on turn number two and it is going to be uh another tap land to follow up the mill train is going but because javier was on the play He's going to get to untap with those two Edgewell Innkeepers. Yeah, untapping with Edgewell Innkeeper, a pretty great feeling. You can even attack with it into Ruin Crab. But I think Javier is actually more interested in stomping down this Ruin Crab now that Seth is blocked with it. He has a decent amount of card advantage available to him, so he may not prioritize drawing two cards here over one as much as getting rid of that Ruin Crab. This is one of the matchups that we have most consistently seen in the past rogues be able to win off a mill game plan they're mm. able to keep the teamer decks board in check and then they're able to maximize ruin crabs alongside some of the incidental draw that the teamer deck has in edgewall innkeeper and the great hand another card we see in javier's hand to really accelerate that mill clock so it, not just a niche win condition for rogues. It is one of the primary ways they can win against this teamer teamer adventure set. Drown in the log is going to take care of one of the two innkeepers on the battlefield, but that does leave Seth tapped out, and Javier finds a brazen borrow off the top. Yeah, Javier got rid of that crab before Seth was able to get that much mill from it. That is really important as we do see a copy of Into the Story available in Seth's hand. That's not costing four anytime soon. That is still costing seven. And all Seth has is a three mana draw spell. But if he uses that this turn, Javier will get the all clear to just slam down Elder Gargaroth if he wants on his next turn. Elder Gargaroth is a big nightmare for these um demir rogue sects you know the f makes your flyers completely irrelevant in terms of board presence ground creatures as well and has trample can't be chumped attack protect draw cards <laughs> <laughs> everything you could possibly want although and you know i think the graveyard count for javier as well is currently at four which means that elder gargoth at least for a little while is going to be able to get under that drown in the lock yeah, and Javier, not even caring about Elder Gargaroth, just takes this opportunity to slam the Great Henge while Seth doesn't have the mana up to interact with it. Great Henge can be a liability if Seth was milling more, mm. but as it stands, now that it's on the battlefield, Seth has no way to get rid of this card. And that means that Javier, even if this Edgewall Innkeeper dies, he's still going to be continuing his card advantage. And with board pressure already down and nothing really on Seth's side, this is looking pretty great for Javier at the moment. Javier, you know, really came out of the gates very quickly on the play with that double Edgewall Innkeeper. Lost one of them to that removal spell, but now with the Great Henge down, we have seen the Great Henge just fuel an unstoppable stream of both board presence and card advantage for these mid-range decks. And that's a good draw. <laughs> nice bit of protection now. I, I, I don't even think coming. Javier needs it as protection. I think what Javier really wants is to save that for the first copy of Into the Story, and it, you have a board presence right now. You you don't need to fight to add to it, really, if you don't want to. You can afford to just sit back on your counterspell if you would like. Let that get countered. Hit for another 
potentially six may actually opt to hold back the one ones just because of the acknowledgement the soaring thought thief exists uh but has the option if he wanted to just attack with everything petty theft the thought thief if it comes down because seth doesn't have the ability to recast it so it's a matter of how much javier prioritizes keeping up the sod coming Looks like it is just going to be Bone Crusher Giant coming in for four. Seth Manfield down to nine after that attack. And we're going to see Javier think about the rest of his resources. Yep, no real downside to putting that copy of Sorit coming on Fortel. Here is that Sorry Thought Thief in the end step, though, for Seth Manfield. Yes, that sort of thought thief, if Javier allows Seth to attack with it, he can try to stop it with a petty theft, would give the last two cards Seth needs in Javier's graveyard to make this uh, into the story cost two less. Uh, as it stands, because Javier is feeling safe, uh, that if Seth uses the mana to interact with this, he may not be able to also cast it into the story after. He goes for the petty theft, and that just buys him so much time, as now he still has that saw coming available next turn brazen borrow representing another two cards drawn and mm. we're getting to the point where if seth even manages to turn on this into the sword for four mana it may be too late to stabilize the board after the fact what can seth do you know other than draw cards here we see him put lurus in hand maybe thinking about uh, using lurus and some of you know its recursion ability to shore up the board presence here there is just one copy of ruin crab i believe though in snack's graveyard and that's the second sora coming off the top for javier dominguez yeah it, it the beautiful thing for Javier here is he can act, counter the first story thought thief and even though he only has access to two blue mana he, you see him using the great hench to foretell <laughs> another sod coming and that means that he has both counter spells available to him so the first two relevant spells the Seth casts are getting countered and here's the first one of those soaring thought thief is on the stack for a very brief period of time before it gets sent away by um, the first copy of that counter spell. Yeah, and we're, we're going to see, see the second. <laughs> yeah. Well, Javier does not does not dawdle on these counter spells. What you know, a huge difference to a more deliberate player like Ray Sato that we were talking about earlier. It just snaps it off, knows immediately what he's going to be doing, and that is going to do it for game number one. The uh, double counter spell there. Too much for Seth Manfield to overcome as we go to the sideboards. Javier was not happy at that game. He, he <laughs> wanted that game to be over <laughs> as quickly as possible and just really play to making sure that happens. I mean, when you have a counter spell that is called Saw It Coming, you kind of have to snap it off, right? Like for the flavor. <laughs> yeah, you were aware that this was what was going to happen. Let's have a look at what's going on in the sideboard there. I see three copies of um, Ox of Agonis coming in for Javier, as well as two copies of Clothers. And boy, it just seems like this deck is designed to beat up on the Rogue strategy. Yeah, if game one for Teamer Adventures is charging up, game two is when you feel like you're at full strength. You have your escape creepers available to you now. You have Clothis, which is just an absolute beating against this Rogue deck. And you have more counter spells. You get to take out your clunkier cards, Aurum's Epiphany, get out. You do not want a 7-mana blue card against a deck that's packing Mystical Disputes. Goldspan Dragon, that's not how you win the game. You're not really attacking through the rogues of this deck more often than not. So you want to just focus on your adventure creatures backed up with escape cards and counter spells. So love the game plan from Javier. And Seth? He I was going to ask you about this, Marnie, because Seth has actually cited out two copies of Ruin Crab, and we were talking about how powerful the mill plan can be against Team Road Adventures. Usually you see players citing out a card like Murphic Wind Robber in that slot, but why do you think the crabs are coming out here? The mill plan is at its most powerful in game one. When you go to game two and the teamer deck gets to bring in Ox of Agonis, milling them becomes a real liability because the whole idea behind the mill game plan from Rogues is your opponent isn't 
doing enough while you're milling them, and by the point they get to do enough, it's too late. If you're turboing your opponent into an Ox of Agonis, which will give them more cards to have counter spells, to have removal spells, to interrupt your game plan, and you've milled half the deck and suddenly your crabs are dead, you're not going to complete that mill. It's not going to happen. And Ox of Agonis more often than not enables that, so I don't think it's overly surprising for Seth not to want to go all in on mill post board when he recognizes those escape creatures are going to come from the team or adventures deck. All right, let's head down and see what happens in the second game here between these two former world champions. Murphic Gwyn Robert, Drown and Lock, Mystical Dispute and Heartless Act, an immediate keep there for Seth Manfield. Someone that's not known for his mulliganing tendencies. <laughs> for Happy Dominion, it looks like it's going to be Sora coming, Brazen Borrower, and Double Mammoth in the opener. Yeah, there are Seth keeps, and then there are actual keeps. And this hand is one of the best the Rogue's deck is capable of. It has an early threat that also mills really fueling your other cards. It has counter spells and removal spells for the cards that can tend to snowball the game away for the team or adventures deck, like that Edgewall Innkeeper. So Seth, in his current position, should really feel like he has all bases covered. And for Javier, this hand is a bit slow. Just infinite three drops here. Double Mammoth, Brazen Borrow doesn't do a lot in the early game. And the Ox of Agonis is a great card in this matchup, but it is a few turns away. Yeah, you would love it to be in your graveyard, not in your opening hand. So this is not the ideal place for the Ox, as Javier would love to find a Bone Crusher Giant here. Just having access to Stomp, get rid of that Wind Robber while you can before your graveyard gets too big and have another threat. But no such luck. No such luck for Javier Dominguez. And that is one of the things about playing Obosh the Prey Piercer as your companion. At the uh, Kaldheim Championships a few weeks ago, we actually saw some players forego the Obosh so that they could play more even CMC or, should I say, mana value spells. But Javier has, has brought the companion. So, you know, the danger there being that you don't often get to do something on turn two or turn four that uses all your mana. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, yes, this deck has plenty to do uh, on those turns. Thanks to adventure cards like Petty Theft and Stomp, it does have the ability to foretell a solid coming. But it can still have awkward draws. It can still have curves where you, you see it looking like this. Everything costs three, and it, you have so many tap lands. You have Kazan, Kazan and Mammoths. You have two Fabled passages. So mm -hmm. no matter how Javier looked at it, if he played that pathway on turn two to have two mana there, maybe to play Petty Theft or Foretell Side coming, he didn't have a guaranteed untapped third land on turn three. And the other thing really about pathways is that you can only really choose one side. They're not dual lands in that sense where they produce both cards and mana when they come down. And you're going to see that now in Javier's hand, there's Kazandu Mammoth that costs green, green, but Brazen Borrow costs blue, blue. And the mana in this deck, you know, can be a little bit fragile. Yeah, the, this Teamer deck it has two different win percentages. It has its win percentage when it starts on a turn one Catria Triome. It has its win percentage <laughs> when it doesn't. And when it has that Catria Triome, I believe it has the highest win percentage of any deck in the format. And when it doesn't, it feels like a mortal deck that could actually lose games of Magic. And here we go, turn three, play out Kazandu Mammoth, you know, three mana, three, three. It does get bigger. He does have the two Fable Passages in hand. So the Mammoth can become a giant threat, but ultimately is just, you know, a, a big dumb body. <laughs> Yeah, big dumb body, not what Javier is looking for here against a board that already has gotten things going. And now with those two copies of removal spells in Seth and, and a mystical dispute to back things up with another threat in the Soaring Thought Thief available to him. This is really scary now for Javier. This is exactly the territory in which Seth wants to be in order to feel like he's going to win the game before Javier does anything. Yeah, Ruin Crab and Fabled Passage, match made in heaven. So we see Seth just cashing both of those in now, getting those untapped lands. And if for those of you keeping count, Javier's Graveyards has enough cards now. <laughs> yeah, it, the count is, you know, enough. Enough. That's all you need. Enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, the magic number's eight, right? But 
let's be serious. Anything above eight, it, it, it's it's academic. Are we actually going to see Ruin Crab come in, sending a message to Javier Dominguez? I Dominance love to see that. Displayed. Check mark love. ticked. Who had who had Ruin Crab attacking on their bingo cards for uh, Strixhaven the Yig weekend? Not I, as Javier draws a net while innkeeper may be too little too late. He does have the option to fetch another island here and be able to go edge while innkeeper into hard cast brazen borrower as a blocker for the sorry thought thief, cashing it in for a card. But, you know, we see that mystical dispute and drowning the lock sitting in Seth's hand. So uh, Seth, not overly worried about this at the moment. Yeah, Seth feeling very secure now, still at 20 life. Has all the rogue synergy going. Lurus still to come. You know, Seth, he would like to find a big a big into the story or similar, but perfectly happy to keep getting in with these flyers and getting the mill going. Yeah, there is some cause for concern if Seth keeps drawing lands that Javier can potentially overload him. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Seth does still have a wind robber to cash in as well. Uh, fortunately for Seth, because Javier has drawn an Ossiva Gonas, there's only two left in the deck, and he hasn't milled one yet. Uh, and I love <laughs> this attack wow. from Seth. Recognizing the potential of the Brazen Borrower, recognizing there's a reason Javier used that Fabled Passage to fetch an island. He's representing something here. Yeah. And there it is. Brazen Borrower draws a card off the Edgewell Keeper, and just trades with that Murphic Wind Robber. And in a couple of turns, we may see Seth Manfield get that engine, so to speak, of Lurus and Murphic Wind Robber going. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him put it in the hand this turn to set it up for next turn uh, while still leaving up this Drown and Loch. Not overly interested in getting rid of the Edgewall Innkeeper at this point, if I had to guess. Uh, may want to save Drown and Loch for something a little bigger, perhaps, but I, no one would blame him for getting rid of this one drop. This has just been such an impressive card here from Throne of Eldraine. Good old Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> what a nice man just you know keeping his in serving drinks making sure you know your your soup's warm and your bed is comfy and... uh, good Manny, old let's go on. Soup. <laughs> well you know i've just been cooped up at home for so long that the thought of going anywhere even if it's like <laughs> a rural <laughs> inn in, in a magical land full of dragons and monsters <laughs> a any outing <laughs> will do at this point any outing will do all right, Bonecrusher Giant is found. Unfortunately, Stump doesn't really deal with either of the creatures on Seth Manville's side of the battlefield. I, I think it would have been interesting to see Seth Javier potentially go for an attack with the Edgewall Innkeeper, uh, proposing the trade between uh, the Innkeeper and the Stump for one of those two creatures. But hey, as it stands, decides to sit back and hopefully the sod coming will be good enough for the Luris, though we know the answer to that is absolutely not, if Seth even goes for it, which he doesn't need to. <laughs> Here comes uh, the Murphic Wind Robber that was drawn for Seth, and to be honest, like, he's doing great just sitting back on all of these, these flyers. Gonna pass the turn, leaving up that Drown and Mystical Dispute. And Javier... Finally finds the second red source down on the battlefield, foretells saw it coming, but the Ox of Agonis isn't that great either when you already have some cards in hand that you kind of want to deploy before, you know, discarding your hand. Yeah, Murfolk Wooden Robber, kind of the Ooh. natural predator predator to the bone crusher giant is it, it does allow you to sacrifice it draw a card and counter the stomp putting the entire creature in the graveyard if you would like and shields down for javier it means seth mm -hmm. has a very clean missile dispute into the story turn if you would like here or just you know dispute leave up drown and continue getting damage across many options available uh looks like he's having a little think about it I would be so tempted at this juncture to just snap off this dispute into the story or into the story dispute. But Seth Manfield, of course, extremely masterful player. And Let's it go. Yeah, it's going to let Grayson Borough come down and 
take this trade with the Soaring Thought Thief. Why might he take this line, Ronnie? Uh, perhaps just wanting to preserve his mana, prioritizing casting into the story. The fact that he has Luris means that the Soaring Thought Thief will come back sooner rather than later, most likely. So perhaps recognizing that he doesn't want to fully put the shields down going into uh, Javier's turn. If he fires off the Into the Story here, he hasn't made a land drop yet. So if he draws a land, he will still have access to Drown the Lock <laughs> available. And now, like we see, Seth gets to feel more comfortable leaving everything up and saying that, okay, I didn't need that Thought Thief to win. I'm still... At this point, it looks like Seth is prioritizing the mill plan thanks to mm. how long this ruin crap has survived and how many cards he's been able to play. Javier only has nine cards left in his deck. Like that just snuck that up is on him. not a lot. Yeah, and Javier sees the writing on the wall is going to scoop up the game. So we're going to see a decider here between the two big juggernauts of this weekend: Demir Rogues and Teamer Adventures. Before we do that, though, we are going to go away for a quick break. But when we come back, we'll have the exciting conclusion to this match. So don't go anywhere. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to coverage of the April Strixhaven League Weekend. My name is Haya and I'm here with Mani. And uh, before the break, we saw the first two games of this uh, classic clash between Demir Rogues and Team Red Adventures. And we are about to see the decider here. Mani, any predictions for the decider? Uh, Javier's going to be on the play. That that means there's more opportunities to have the kind of draw that we saw in game one, turn one, turn two, Edgewell Innkeepers, snowball away with some adventure creatures if possible. It, Seth, again, post-board, he doesn't have that much. What he had game two was a perfect hand, and that was more than enough to get the game in his favor. But, it, you know, the matchup is... It, in terms of cards slanted towards Javier, though we do always know that Rose is the favorite. So it, it's really going to come down to a matter of drawing whether Javier can capitalize on that being on the play here in game three. All right, well, let's find out what happens as we take a look at the player's opening hands here. Four lands, double Murphic Wind Robber and Drown in the Lock for Seth Manfield going up against Double Brazen Borrower and Oxabagonus for Javier. Both players finding a little bit of what they need. Yeah, a little bit of what they need, but this hand from Javier is concerningly slow. There's no stomps, there's uh, no real pressure other than these Brazen Borrowers that aren't great pressure against cards like Merfolk Wind Robber, and there's no Edgewall Innkeeper. So uh, from Javier, he, he does have some tools, but this isn't the type of hand that you can snowball a game with. And just finds a favored passage off the top so nothing to do in the opening couple of turns here for Javier and we see Seth though also just finding Agadim's Awakening although that Soaring Thought Thief is going to go well with these two Murphic Wind Robbers yeah, we saw the awkwardness of Rogue's mana poke its head into the game there uh, on Seth's first turn. He had two untapped islands. However, because both of those were islands, that he didn't have the Sagadim's Awakening yet, if he started with a turn one Wind Robber, he was accepting the fact on, that on turn two, he more or less had to go 
second wind robber tapland pass and wouldn't have access to soaring thought thief so rather seth opted to go with a turn one tapland and leave this line of play available to him which is just play an untapped land on turn two leave up soaring thought thief past the turn these brazen borrowers will work out well here for javier he he can freely pass the turn if he would like and just petty theft the soaring thought thief back to Seth's hand for a couple of turns though mm. there is always the option available to him to just get aggressive play a red source play a bone crusher giant as a 4-3 and it, put the onus on seth to deal with it as javier will be the one attacking it is tempting on the play javier just gonna quickly pass the second main phase little arena trick to see maybe what's going on in your in your opponent's hand yeah a little priority check as it were um <laughs> and is actually going to do the first thing that you talked about, Marnie, sit back on these petty thefts. Both players dancing around each other in the opening turns here, and Seth's going to make the first move, putting Soaring Thought Thief down in the end step. Yeah, Javier wanted to make sure that he has priority to get rid of this Thought Thief before Seth untaps and has access to his mana. As it stands, he's not worried about Seth doing anything scary uh, on his turn. So just avoiding cards like Mystical Dispute that could be relevant in that position. And uh, this is Javier playing the tempo game. He recognizes that with these adventure creatures and with that Oxyvagonus, he actually has the sort of draw that can win a card advantage game. So rather, he just doesn't want to get run over by rogues getting some pressure, milling some cars, turning on cars like into the story. And it, something really great for Javier here is there's no cards in this graveyard. Drown in the Lockover on Seth's side has close to no text at the moment. Uh, Seth's going to continue to, you know, be cautious, just developing out one copy of Murphy Gwyn Robert sitting back on that story of Thought Thief that, of course, Javier already knows about. River Glide pathway off the top for Javier Dominguez. Yeah, let's do it again. This time he has the stomp available to him to get rid of this wind robber while petty thefting the sorry thought thief again. We'll likely see both of those happen here on the end step stomp first. Wind robber is a natural counter, but only if your opponent has eight cards in their graveyard. We're nowhere close to that. So right now, Javier continues to just keep the board completely clean from Seth Manfield. And Seth has a dead card in his hand. <laughs> yeah, the, these petty thefts have become quite the annoyance for Seth Manfield, just repeatedly sending that Soaring Thought Thief back to hand. But Seth does find a second copy now. Second ready copy to be of Thought Thief. Really good. Mm. I mean, if you know, one Thought Thief is scary enough, but when these start going off, you know, both triggering in every attack step, it, the, the cards add up pretty quickly. Yeah, it, it is interesting here as Seth has the option of playing Double Thought Thief, but he also had the option available to him to just go Merfolk Wind Robber Thought Thief again. The downside to playing Double Thought Thief here is if he wants to attack with a Thought Thief to get some cards in Javier's graveyard, he's making it vulnerable to trading with one of those Brazen Borrowers that he knows about. If he plays mm -hmm. a Merfolk Wind Robber there, he still has the option of playing Thought Thief pre combat of the next turn and getting the full four cards milled that he's looking for without putting a Thought Thief at risk or putting himself in a position where he has to use another card like that Drown and Lock to keep his Thought Thieves alive. So really from Seth, this is a nod to what his game plan is and where his mindset is in terms of the cards that matter in the matchup so for javier there is an option this turn to just you know go for that ox and that is option what he's accepted. actually going to do <laughs> there's, anytime there's a chance for an ox i'm gonna take you know it. Now, that, now that you mentioned it Hayu, that seems pretty tempting i think i'm gonna take those three cards thank you <laughs> Well, it's only plus one, but I guess the other two are land, so we don't really care about those. And uh, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna happen. As Ox of Agonis hits the battlefield, drown in the lock, as we've mentioned before, doesn't do anything when your opponent's graveyard is empty. And uh, now, for those who are counting, it is there are two cards, so drown in the lock. I'm not gonna be able to do, do do anything against this Ox just yet. About to be six and. This is the danger zone. Javier put down the Brazen Borrower. He gave Seth the go-ahead in order to 
turn his hand into more relevant cards, but now Seth gets to attack, and now the cards have been milled. He's getting close to six, seven, eight cards in the graveyard, turning on Merfolk Wind Robber, turning on into the story, drowned in the locks, fully turned on at this point, and Javier doesn't have that much pressure. These thought thieves are going to be fast clocks soon. This is still looking pretty I... scary for Javier. <laughs> It is scary, but also, you know, there is an ox on the battlefield. There are brazen borrowers to either trade with these soaring thought thieves or preserve pressure. And something that we haven't talked about a lot this match is Obosh the Prey Piercer. Sometimes these teamer decks can just kill you out of nowhere with brazen borrowers that do six when they hit. Yeah, out, out of nowhere is... Not as applicable here as all of those cards are essentially face up. Seth is aware of two borrowers, he's aware of Bo Obaj, so at any point that becomes a viable line for Javier until either Javier has close to eight mana or puts Obaj in hand. That's not a sequence that Seth is too worried about, and he has the flyers to essentially set up for it. But once that becomes a possibility, it's something that Seth will make every play with that in mind. And, uh, Part of it right now is we see him saying no to card advantage as he shuts down the Nezhul <laughs> Keeper before it comes into play. All right. Double Soaring Thought Thief. There is a Marfic Wind Robber, and now Seth finds of one mind, which I believe would cost one if uh, the Wind Robber came down. Yeah, Merfolk, not a human. Sorry, Thought Thief is a human of one mind condition. Met as uh, Javier will take the trade, but the damage is... Uh, literally and figuratively already done by these thought thieves. 12 cards in the graveyard now. Definitely passes the uh, enough threshold. <laughs> Look, I'm just trying to break it down for those of us who aren't all, you know, numbers and, and figures and whatnot. <laughs> all I need to know is, is it enough? Yes? Okay, here comes cool. Lurus. And that's going to allow some uh, creatures to be played out of the graveyard here for Seth Manfield. Um, Marnie, what are you prioritizing? Well, Luris also uh, fulfills the condition of, of One Mind, so I, I wouldn't mind Seth just starting the turn off with that of One Mind, trying to draw a card. If you're casting Merfolk Windrower anyways, uh, draw the two cards first if that is your game plan, and then decide whether you want to go for Windrower or Soaring Thought Thief. But it makes some sense to just go for double Windrower here. Uh, it gives you the option of chump blocking the Ox rather than taking too much damage next turn, and still having a Windrower available as an attacker so you don't expose your other Thought Thief to that Brazen Borrower. Seth Stanfield now looking in a dominant position. Three flyers in the air. Ox of Agonis coming across that could trade with a Marfolk Wind Robber, or the Wind Robber could just go for that block sack um, sequence that we've seen so many times before. Yeah, the most important thing about Seth's dominance here is Lurus is unchecked. Uh, Seth mm -hmm. doesn't know it yet, of course, but by the time Javier passes the turn and the best thing he has access to in terms of dealing with Lurus is another petty theft, Seth will feel comfortable that Lurus is, in fact, unchecked if Javier petty thefts it at all. And that means Seth is going to just continue snowballing advantage. When Javier kills this Lurus the first time, Agadim's Awakening is there. When Javier kills this Lurus the second time, Agadim's <laughs> Awakening is there. Like a good neighbor, Agadim's Awakening will be there to carry you in your time of need. You must have very nice neighbors, Marnie. I live in a cold-hearted... <laughs> distant apartment building with millions of people in it and nobody knows each other and That's uh, a big apartment Blast building there's a big apartment building Blast Rock Beast comes down <laughs> and um, you know we're just going to see Javier Dominguez working with some of these three drop adventure creatures and they look great when you have an Edgewell Innkeeper and you're drawing cards or you have a great hand and you're drawing cards but oh my god at the end of the day it, if you don't have those engine pieces they are just three drop creatures and here we go Seth Manfield oh flies off off one mind <laughs> finds more card draw finds it another story stop. thief <laughs> I don't know where this train is going, but I'm not getting off, says <laughs> Seth Manfield. <laughs> he does know where this train is going. It's going to victory in, in round one of the April Strixhaven League weekend. Yeah, this is so, so unbelievably tough for Javier to come back into right now. Seth 
fully able to play this aggressively or defensively if you would like. The aggressive option here is just play two Soaring Thought Thieves and attack, force a trade with a Brazen Borrower, etc, etc. Defensively, you play another Wind Robber from your graveyard. Those are trump blockers. You're casting into the story. You're drawing up to six more cards in the next turn cycle. And it's rogues with seven mana and nine cards in hand, that's not really a deck or a board state anyone could be. It's it's just not really doable. I mean, maybe if Javier can, like, nip over to oh one of the mono-red players and borrow an Embercleave, we might be able to see something happen. But since that's an illegal game action, we are going to see Seth Manfield keep going, putting down these Murphic Wind Robbers and uh, getting in. Still just it looks like going to hold that Soaring Thought Thief back. Yeah, Seth, Seth has chosen to play defensively. At this point, he doesn't he doesn't care about Javier's life total until he does. He, he's going to whittle away, mill some cards, but if Javier is a bit careless, suddenly Seth is going to go, okay, triple Soaring Thought Thief, all my creatures are getting plus three, plus zero, now you're dead on the spot. Until then, eh, mill two. Uh, mill two. I, I have my blockers. I'm not exposing <laughs> it. Mill two. Mill two. <laughs> mill two go. <laughs> and um, Javi, you know, he knows exactly what's happening here. Has to come swinging in with the team. Thieves Guild Enforcer, not really what he wants to see here because that's going to be able to trade with the Love Strike Beast unless he decides to save it with the Petty Theft. Yeah, I, I feel like Javier may be forced after these blocks to have some sort of petty theft leave up side coming for Luris sequence. Uh, you know, it's not pretty, but <laughs> neither is leaving Luris on the side of the battlefield of Seth Madfield. Bone Crusher Giant, well, what are you what are you going to do with that? Uh, considering you're not really attacking, your opponent just has infinite uh, these guild enforcers in the graveyard so uh, javier just has every bad option in the world available to him here as uh mm -hmm. 30 cards left in the deck not getting milled that much but uh, already the game just feels close to impossible when you're looking at infinite infinite, cards. <laughs> infinite cards. i'm so jealous of seth right now there's nothing better than that feeling when you know your divinations find more divinations and here we go you thought Ancestral Recall was a busted vintage card. No. <laughs> We're going to see Of One Mind do a great impression as Eliminate uh, is going to try and take care of this Bone Crusher Giant. Yeah, Javier may just need to keep it alive here with that song coming. But again, this is Seth getting free reign to do whatever he wants. Thieves Guild Enforcer out of the yard as a blocker. Another Soaring Thought Thief. Two Soaring Thought Thieves available to him if you would like. And now he can attack with that Soaring Thought Thief that he has because uh, Javier's shields are essentially down. There's no flyers available. So uh, Seth has everything <laughs> available. Literally everything Whoa, available. What about Lol Mage's Domination? We talked about this card right at the beginning when we were looking at the deck list. Hadn't come into play until just right this very moment. But Lol Mage's Domination is such a sweet card. Gonna take control of that Bone Crusher Giant. Get shocked in the face as the tax for doing so. But at this point, Seth Manfield does not care about that at all. <laughs> Yeah, this unlocks the Loris. You'll gain your three life back. It's it, it's an interest loan, you know. It, it, you you paid two, you're gaining three. It's going to work out in your favor eventually. Uh, and now Seth gets to attack with all, still able to play that Thieves Guild Enforcer from the graveyard should he choose. I think he's actually uh, <laughs> going to potentially just play it anyways and now yeah, feel well, fully safe that whatever happens, happens. And not to mention, it also gives you know, that two points of mill as well. And Marnie, paying two to game three is the type of MTG finance that I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> that basic mountain off the top for Javier Dominguez. He really needed a big draw there, but did not find it. And we think that the nail is approaching the coffin. Yeah, th there's not many ways that uh, Seth loses this game. One of the perhaps maybe blocking this Ox of Agonis. I think at 11 life and 
two cards in Javier's hand that Seth knows can't burn him out because I believe the copy of Perforosa's Infravention is already in the graveyard and can't go to the face anyways. It's face mode is the creature it creates. So Seth not blocking that ox, not giving Javier the option to draw three new cards. And yeah, I the writing is all but on the wall here. Well, Javier does have a Petty Theft and a Brazen Borrower. So if Seth attacks with everything, the 1-1 one, one can present a chump on the ground. And he could deal with two of the other attackers, but <laughs> thinking about the concede button. Javier can Petty Theft the Bone Crusher Giant, go down to four, use the Bone Crusher Giant to kill Loris, play Brazen Borrower as a blocker, and... Still more or less die. Still die? <laughs> yeah. He, oh, oh he's killing his... Oh, okay, okay. No. <laughs> Desperation, thy I name love is this. Ox. Get that ox in the graveyard. I mean, that's one benefit of you know, this infinite milling that's happened. Plenty of fuel for this ox to escape. Empty handed, so this is just going to be drawing three cards, you know, for zero cost here. Mr. Lotus Feet, Edgel and Keeper, and a second Ox. That no, that, that ain't it. <laughs> it's not going to do it here what? for Javier Dominguez. No chance to deploy any of these. And he is going to scoop it up. Seth Manfield takes down the first round in pod B of the MPL. 